Good evening, everybody. I am so honored to be here at the legendary Y. And, and it gives me so much pleasure to be introducing two awesome poets tonight. Jane Hirschfield is a poet of extended time and space. Nothing is too small or evanescent for her keen attention. The feet of an ant make their own sound on the earth, she writes. Nor is anything too large. In sky, an essay, radiation, smoke, mosquitoes, the music of Mahler fly through it. The sky makes room, adjusting its airy shoulder. And so we look right past sky, by it, through it, to what also is moody and alters, erosive mountains, eclipsable moons, stars distant but death-bound. Everything in Hirschfield is a synecdoche or metaphor for everything else. Everything is connected and at the same time with a kind of Buddhist sleight of hand, solitary and empty. She does not shrink from the sharpest of epigrams. Let them not say we did not see it. We saw. How much cruel history, past and future, is in these few words. I'll say them again. Let them not say we did not see it. We saw. Yet she also dwells on food, the weather and daily routine. She knows why the immortals in Greek myth entered the world of bodies. She is a participant observer of her own body and the world's body. She writes intimate addresses to her little soul. She imagines herself a horse, a fish, woodpecker, elephant, dog who takes the bone and goes to another room where it just fits under the low-legged table or couch. She lists cities. Ferguson, Charleston, Aleppo, Sarajevo, Nagasaki, places of untold trauma. Without judgment, she keeps tabs on things, for that is what a ledger does. Here's a poem entitled, Now a Darkness is Coming. I hold my life with two hands. I walk with two legs. Two ears are enough to hear Bach with. Blinded in one eye, a person sees with the other. Now a great darkness is coming, a both eyes darkness. I have one mouth. It holds two words, yes, no inside all others. Yes, no, no, yes. I say yes to these words as I must, and I also refuse them. My two legs shaped to go forward, obedient to can't know and must be, walk into the time that is coming. Jane is philosophical without the pinch of logic. She is compassionate without a drop of pious rhetoric. Her poetry, her mind, to use yet another of her fine phrases, is a vest of many pockets. She is a sister of Wallace Stevens, but warmer. Author of nine volumes of poetry, most recently The Beauty and Ledger, She's a translator of Japanese and Hindi poetry, an essayist whose book Nine Gates, Entering the Mind of Poetry, is almost as lovely as her poems, and whose anthology, Women in Praise of the Sacred, 43 Centuries of Spiritual Poetry by Women, gives us a seductive taste of her own ancestry and is lavishly readable. With awards too numerous to list, Hirschfeld's is a poetry so steady, so gracious, it makes one read steadily, graciously. It makes one wish to turn the page steadily, 
graciously, observing the movement of one's own arm. Please join me in welcoming Jane Hirschfield. I think I'm going to have Alicia read all of my poems for me. She reads them so well. I, I, I cannot, I actually can't see you, so um, I don't know uh, how to thank you enough, those of you who have come out and braved being in one another's company <laughs> and the company of poetry uh, tonight to help me. Uh, this is the very first reading from this book. Its official uh, release date is tomorrow, um, so thank you. Um, the book is titled Ledger, as, as Alicia said, um, because not least it is attempting to take account of an absolutely unaccountable time, which I think we all feel we are living in now. Um, and it, you know, it speaks of the crises of the biosphere and of inequality and of refugees and violence and our incomprehensible human blindness to the fact that we live with one another on a small, fragile planet amid shared fates with all beings. Um, so I, I'm going to start with one of the poems that Alicia uh, quoted part of, a poem uh, that is its own attempt to unwrite its need to have been written in the first place. Let them not say. Let them not say we did not see it. We saw. Let them not say we did not hear it. We heard. Let them not say they did not taste it. We ate. We trembled. Let them not say it was not spoken, not written. We spoke. We witnessed with voices and hands. Let them not say they did nothing. We did not enough. Let them say, as they must say something, a kerosene beauty, it burned. Let them say we warmed ourselves by it, read by its light, praised, and it burned. Uh, this next poem is one of the counting poems, if I can find it, sorry. As if hearing heavy furniture moved on the floor above us. As things grow rarer, they enter the ranges of counting. Remain this many Siberian tigers, that many African elephants, 300 red-legged egrets. We scrape from the world its tilt and meander of wonder as if eating the last burned onions and carrots from a cast iron pan. Closing eyes to taste better the char of ordinary sweetness. Uh, the bowl of this poem's title uh, could be any bowl in any kitchen. Uh, it also has a little bit in it the bowl of uh, the practice of takahatsu uh, when Buddhist monks go out into the world with an empty bowl and whatever is put in it is what they will have for, for their next meal. The bowl. If meat is put into the bowl, Meat is eaten. If rice is put into the bowl, it may be cooked. If a shoe is put into the bowl, the leather is chewed and chewed over, a sentence that cannot be taken in or forgotten. A day, if a day could feel, must feel like a bowl. Wars, loves, trucks, betrayals, kindness, it eats them. 
Then the next day comes spotless and hungry. The bowl cannot be thrown away. It cannot be broken. It is calm, uneclipsable, rindless, and big though it seems, fits exactly in two human hands. Hands with 10 fingers, 54 bones, capacities strange to us, almost past measure. Scented as the curve of the bowl is, with cardamom, star anise, long pepper, cinnamon, hyssop. I wanted to be surprised. To such a request, the world is obliging. In just the past week, a rotund porcupine, who seemed equally startled by me. The man who swallowed a tiny microphone to record the sounds of his body, not considering beforehand how he might remove it a cabbage and mustard sandwich on marbled bread. How easily the large spiders were caught with a clear plastic cup surprised even them. I don't know why I was surprised every time love started or ended, or why each time a new fossil, earth-like planet, or war, or that no one kept being there when the doorknob had clearly which should not have been so surprising, my error after error, recognized when appearing on the faces of others. What did not surprise enough, my daily expectation that anything would continue, and then that so much did continue when so much did not. Small rivulets still flowing downhill when it wasn't raining. A sister's birthday. Also, the stubborn, courteous persistence that even today, please means please. Good morning is still understood as good morning. And that when I wake up, the window's distant mountain remains a mountain. The borrowed city around me is still a city and standing. Its alleys and markets, offices of dentists, drugstore, liquor store, Chevron. It's library that charges, a happy surprise, no fine for overdue books. Borges, Baldwin, Zimborska, Morrison, Kavafi. So the actual uh, one of uh, what this next poem is about is hanging in the room backstage. Um, I always travel with it now. Vest. I put on again the vest of many pockets. It is easy to forget which holds the reading glasses, which the small pen, which the house keys, the compass and whistle, the passport. To forget at last for weeks, even the pocket holding the day of digging a place for my sister's ashes. The one holding the day where someone will soon enough put my own to misplace the pocket of touching the walls at Auschwitz would seem impossible. It is not. To misplace for a decade the pocket of tears. I rummage and rummage, transfers for Munich, for Melbourne, to Oslo, a receipt for a Singapore copy, a device holding music, Bach, Garcia, Richter, Porter, Paired. A woman long dead now gave me, when I told her I could not sing, a kazoo, now in a pocket. Somewhere a pocket holding a Steinway. Somewhere a pocket holding a packet of salt. Borgesian vest, Oxford English dictionary vest with a magnifying glass tucked inside one snap-closed pocket. Wikipedia vest. Rosetta vest, enigma vest of decoding. How is it one person can carry your weight for a lifetime, one person slip into your open arms 
for a lifetime, who was given the world and hunted for tissues for chapstick. Uh, so this next poem has many, many things in it. Uh, it has the International Space Station, it has evolution, it has the asteroid that caused the last, most recent fifth extinction, it has land formation in Florida, it has terrorism, it has Syria, um, and it has the uh, refugee crisis in the Mediterranean, which even though it is years since this poem was written, never seems to end. Day beginning with seeing the International Space Station and a full moon over the Gulf of Mexico and all its invisible fishes. None of this had to happen. Not Florida, not the ibis's beak, not water, not the horseshoe crab's empty body, and not the living starfish. Evolution might have turned left at the corner and gone down another street entirely. The asteroid might have missed. The seams of limestone need not have been susceptible to sand and mangroves. The radio might have found a different music. The hips of one man and the hips of another might have stood beside each other on a bus in Aleppo and recognized themselves as long-lost brothers. The key could have broken off in the lock, and the nail can refused its lid. I might have been the fish the brown pelican swallowed. You might have been the way the moon kept not setting long after we thought it would, long after the sun was catching inside the low wave curls coming in at a certain angle. The light might not have been eaten again by its moving. If the unbearable were not weightless, we might yet buckle under the grief of what hasn't changed yet. Across the world, a man pulls a woman from the water from which the leapt from overfilled boat has entirely vanished. From the water pulls one child, another. Both are living and both will continue to live. This did not have to happen. No part of this had to happen. Words. Words are loyal. Whatever they name, they take the side of. As the word courage will afterward grip just as well the frightened girl soldier who stands on one side of barbed wire, the frightened boy soldier who stands on the other. Death's clay, they look at each other with wide open eyes. And words that love peace, love gossip, refuse to condemn them. I'm wearing this scarf on this book tour because I uh, got it in the souk in Aleppo, Syria, uh, which has since been destroyed. Uh, I was traveling through Syria with a small group of American writers and one of our hosts was a woman anesthesiologist uh, who was translating for us and, and making sure when the women went into the mosques that we knew how to comport ourselves correctly. She was an extraordinary person. She is an extraordinary person. And I worried about her terribly when the Civil War began. And I worried terribly about all the university students whom I had talked to in 2007 when Syria was still a country taking in refugees from the war in Iraq next door. Um, Sahar did um, leave 
Syria. She moved to Paris with her son, and uh, she began working in uh, Médecins Sans Frontières shortly after that, and now for the United Nations. Um, she sits behind this poem. She breathes in the scent. As the front of a box would miss the sides, the back, the grief of the living misses the grief of the dead. It is like a woman who goes to the airport to meet the planes from a country she long ago lived in. She knows no passenger, but stands near as they exit, still holding their passports. She breathes in the scent of their clothes. Practice. I touch my toes. When I was a child, this was difficult. Now I touch my toes daily. In 2012, in Sanford, Florida, someone nearby was touching her toes before bed. Three weeks ago, in the Philippines or Myanmar, someone was stretching. Tomorrow, someone elsewhere will bend, first to one side, then the other. I also do 10 push-ups, morning and evening. Women's push-ups from the knees. They resemble certain forms of religious bowing. In place of one, two, four, seven, I count the names of incomprehension. Sanford, Ferguson, Charleston, Aleppo, Sarajevo, Nagasaki. I never reach Troy, Ur. I have done this for years now. Bystander, listener, one of the lucky. I do not seem to grow stronger. I sometimes write uh, very short poems that I call pebbles. Um, pebbles are not haiku unless so labeled. Um, haiku are different, uh, but they take some of that sense of distillation and um, marry it to other forms in the short tradition of, of aphorism and uh, never limerick. I'm hoping someday to write a good limerick, but not yet. Um, so anyhow, three, three very short poems. Library book with many precisely turned down corners. I unfold carefully the thoughts of one who has come before me. The way a listening dog's ears may be seen lifting to some sound beyond its person's quite understanding. Sixth, extinction. It took with it the words that could have described it. Obstacle. This body still walking. The wind must go around it. So I'm going to read you the title poem of the book. Um, it is uh, called Ledger. And this poem will sound a little different from anything that I've read you thus far, because it has more, it is not a perfectly rhyming poem, but it is more driven by its sounds. Um, so there's a lot, of, a lot of rhyme in it. And it has been carefully fact-checked by friends. I didn't do the counting entirely myself. Ledger. Tchaikovsky, oh, I'm going to um, mention that this poem was written uh, as was uh, the earlier one about the space station uh, during a time when I was working on Captiva Island off the Gulf Coast of Florida. Uh, the painter Robert Rauschenberg left his estate with many buildings on it to be a uh, refuge for artists to come and work in. Uh, this was in 2016. The 
Uh, months I was there were the rainiest months in Florida history. Uh, Captiva is five feet high at its highest point. We were wading between the buildings, and it was one of the moments when I realized that climate change is not something that is going to happen in the future. Uh, in California, I breathe its smoke every autumn. In Florida, I was wading in sea rise. Um, one unfamiliar word in it may be LIDAR. Uh, LIDAR is a form of radar, which is about to become very well known because it's what self-driving cars use, but it was first invented to be used from an airplane and take very, very accurate uh, measurements of the height of the ground beneath it. Ledger. Tchaikovsky's Eugene Onegin is 3,592 measures. A voice kept far from feeling is heard as measured. What's wanted in desperate times are desperate measures. Pushkin's unfinished Onegin, 5,446 lines. No visible tears measure the pilot's grief as she lidars the height of an island, five feet. 50, its highest leaf. She logs the years, the weathers the tree has left. A million fired clay bones, animal, human, set down in a field as protest, measure 400 yards long, 60 yards wide, weigh 112 tons, the length and weight and silence of the bereft. Bees do not question the sweetness of what sways beneath them. One measure of distance is meters, another is li. 10,000 li can be translated far. For the exiled, home can be translated then, translated scar. One liter of Polish vodka holds 12 pounds of potatoes. What we care about most we call beyond measure. What matters most we say counts. Height now is treasure. On this scale of one to 10, where is 11? Ask all you wish, no 25th hour will be given. Measuring mounts like some western bars mounted elk head are cataloged vanishing unfinished heaven. Uh, this next poem was written January 24th, 2017. It's called On the Fifth Day. That was the fifth day of the current administration. That was the day that the news broke that the White House had taken all climate change information off its website and had, for the first time of several, uh, instructed all research scientists not to speak of their work in public until it was vetted. Um, many of my closest friends are research scientists, and I felt this as keenly as if it had been, you know, the poets who had been told to be silent. On the fifth day. On the fifth day, the scientists who studied the rivers were forbidden to speak or to study the rivers. The scientists who studied the air were told not to speak of the air and the ones who worked for the farmers were silenced, and the ones who worked for the bees. Someone from deep in the badlands began posting facts. The facts were told not to speak and were taken away. The facts, surprised to be taken, were silent. Now it was only the rivers that spoke of the rivers and only the wind that spoke of its bees while the unpausing, factual buds of the fruit trees continued to move toward their fruit. The silence spoke loudly of silence, and the rivers kept speaking of rivers, of boulders and air. Bound to gravity, earless and tongueless, the untested rivers kept speaking. Bus drivers, shelf stockers, code writers, machinists, accountants, 
lab techs, cellists kept speaking. They spoke the fifth day of silence. Uh, so the poem, the handwritten poem that you have in the program is the actual first draft of this, which had not yet found its proper ending. Um, I can't believe I actually let you see it, um, but I did. So I'm going to end with a small suite of more personal poems. Um, these are poems that borrow from the Roman Emperor Hadrian, a phrase from the only poem we have of his. He wrote it on his deathbed, bidding farewell to his life, which he addressed as Little Soul. Uh, the first poem also has a Latin title, uh, the phrase Amor Fati, embrace of your own fate, love of your own fate. Um, and there, there are uh, a group of them, but they tend to be pretty short. Amor Fati. Little soul, you have wandered lost a long time. The woods all dark now, birded and eyed. Then a light, a cabin, a fire, a door standing open. The fairy tales warn you, do not go in. You who would eat will be eaten. You go in, you quicken. You want to have feet. You want to have eyes. You want to have fears. Snow. Little soul, for you too, death is coming. Was there something you thought you needed to do? Snow does not walk into a room and wonder why. Kitchen. Little soul, how useful was hunger. From whatever it was we fell into, you and I, it sprang open our fingers' grip. Yet a life is not prepared for its ending like a sliced eggplant, salted and pressed to let leave from itself what is bitter. Harness. Little soul, you and I will become the memory of a memory of a memory. A horse released of the traces forgets the weight of the wagon. Rust flakes on wind. Little soul, a day comes when retrospection ceases. A person falling does not mid-plummet look up. Still, for a few seconds on Wednesday, where are my truck keys? On Thursday, on Sunday, where are my truck keys? Pelt. Little soul, the book of your hours is closing over its golds, its reds, your gazing dog, your river's ladder's ribcage. A life turns into its patterns and perfumes, then into its pelt. I don't know now if we were one, if we were two, a stippling. Whither thou goest, wheat said. Wood, salt, tin. Little soul, do you remember? You once walked over wooden boards to a house that sat on stilts in the sea. It was early. The sun painted brightness onto the water, and wherever you sat, that path led directly to you. Some mornings the sea road was muted, scratched tin. Some mornings blinding. Then it would leave. Little soul, it is strange. Even now, it is early. I said, I said, I believed, a world without you unimaginable, now cutting its flowers 
to go with you into the fire. Thank you all very much. Patricia Smith is a living, breathing, I might say fire-breathing, refutation of the false division between spoken word poetry and poetry of the book. A division that is really all just about race and class, so we can forget about it. An astonishing four-time National Poetry Slam champion, she has moved into becoming a National Book Award finalist, a Pulitzer Prize finalist, winner of awards from the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Foundation for the Arts, the Kingley Tufts Award, and numerous other honors. She's a playwright and a children's book author and an actress. And an extraordinary storyteller, creator of individual characters, living and dead. Her seven collections of poetry include Close to Death, Elegies for the Lives of Black Men Gripped by Homicide, Drug Abuse, and AIDS. Tea House of the Almighty, in which she is a teacher whose sixth graders wi whisper wet and urgent in my ear, shout me raw. And in response to the death question, which is a question to the sixth graders whether they know any dead people. 40 fists punch the air, me, me, me. Or again, she draws a woman whose father and husband have died in Iraq, her womb tingling vaguely with the next soldier. Blood dazzler in the voices of New Orleans people living and dying in Hurricane Katrina, including the unforgettable narcissistic diva voice of the hurricane herself. In Shoulda Been Jimmy Savannah, she, she writes about her childhood and brags of herself. Your rebellious heart constructed of lard and salt, you are built of what should kill you. And now, to break our hearts and inflame our consciences, incendiary art, a 21st century book of martyrs, grounded in the retold and retold killing of Emmett Till, commemorating the deaths of murdered black men and boys and the desperate grieving of their mothers, in language as irresistible as a chokehold, as dense as the silt at the bottom of a river. In fact, two of the poems deal with fathers drowning their own daughters. Language in the voice of a gun in a policeman's hand that says over and over again, I just had an accident. I just had an accident. Language rich in human body parts, flesh, hip, bulge of bone, organs, grease, sweat that drips an awful hallelujah. Hollowed eye socket, lengthy streak of browning blood, 
on the street of Ferguson, Missouri in 2014, which you will remember is the blood of Michael Brown that could, in the poem dedicated to him, that blood could, could be a sanctified walkway for the church ladies, for that new kind of worship Irony doesn't get more bitter than this. Or in, or in Birmingham, 1963, where baby girls burn, boom, while the Lord dangles festive and hopeless. Patricia Smith's poetry is news that stays news. It is also torrential music Describing herself in an interview as a grandchild of the Great Migration, coming of age poetically in West Side Chicago, one of the country's most formidable and adventurous creative communities, metaphorically clutching the hand of Gwendolyn Brooks. She has claimed poetry as necessary breath. Mistress of rhythm and blues, gospel cadence and street slang, rhyme and rumble, and also of villanelles, sonnets, sestinas, terza rima, sapphics, hazels, tankas. Listen to this daughter of Motown. Listen to the force of her music. In her adopted city, please join me in welcoming Patricia Smith. Thank you. That was so musical. I was backstage going, I wonder who she's talking about. <laughs> How's everyone doing? It's a real honor to stand here where so many poets I love have stood, and that includes Jane. I really enjoyed that. Good luck with your new book. Um, and hi, everybody. Thank you for coming out. You're going to write this. But what verbs do you employ when it's clear that you are trying to side-eye murder your mother, when you are the chilling moral of every blazing honor thy mama Sunday sermon, when you are nothing less than blasphemy blown wide? How do you lift the bleeding cell to your ear when what you hope to hear is an awkward cough, introducing some industrious nurse's practice coup? And I'm so sorry to inform you, followed by a flat trisyllable twang, the name of the Alabama woman who spent years drilling you with grammatically hilarious tenets and a gospel so austere you wet the bed believing it. All you remember of those unrelenting lessons is a sky-eyed white man posed to consecrate and slap you sinless, and a heaven spewing feral light just beyond your fingers. It was your mother who begged a confounded congregation to infuse you with the holy, so a bevy of bored elders mumbled a few maybes and shoved your nappy head inside a plastic pool of tepid water, one quickly twitching a nipple while you flailed but that drowning meant your mother loved you. That little drench whitened and reversed you, scoured you ripe for the Lord's gold touch. You were forgiven for so brashly sporting your father's face and its landscape of Negro nose, for the way you ruined your Delta mother's practice city body, crudely driving your slick and bloody head through her and out straight into her damned business. You almost killed her, the story goes and goes. When your father died, she turned her wide back to your grief, unmothered you for 10 years. She almost killed you, your story goes and goes. Then suddenly, teenier and wheezing, she resurrected, fervently reclanging the bells of heaven, begging you to subsidize her dream gilded send-off, somehow trusting you to procure blooms and acquire all while you're scanning her life for a plug to pull. And oh yes, the Lord, through your mother, 
says to please forgive her for the years she spent praying herself childless. But even with salvation all lined up, you can't resist being her hellish spawn as she survives hardy and selfish as a roach. You perk up whenever her wee body goes ghostly, whisper to her about brisk dispersals, the sanctity of the pyre. But you could not say dead and mean her, not yet, though she's nameless in this story as it goes and goes. I waited until I got out here to decide what I was going to read. Don't you love that? <laughs> OK, this one. Yeah. Hmm. Really, it's like I, I listen to the audience, and I listen to the poet before, and it puts me in a mood. And then I'm like, OK, I think that might be it. And then I, don't, I can't find the page. Oh, it's coming, I know it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Okay. Uh, there was a street in Chicago, uh, where I'm from, Madison Street, and Madison Street would cut through the west side of Chicago. I'm from the west side, that was a part of town everybody told you to stay away from. And I wanted to recreate a ride on the Madison Street bus. Tavern. Tavern, church, shuttered tavern, then Goldblatt's with its finger smeared display windows full of stifled plaid pinafore and hard tailored serge, each unattainable thread cooing the delayed lusciousness of layaway. Another church then, of course, Jesus pitching a blustery bitch on every other block. Then the butcher shop with, hard to believe, the blanched archaic head of a hog propped upright to lure waffling patrons into the steamy innards of yet another storefront, where they drag their feet through sawdust and revel in the come-hither bouquet of blood. Then a vacant lot, then another vacant lot, right up against a shoe store specializing in unyielding leather, all stars and glittered stacked heels designed for the Christian woman daring the jukebox. Then the whatnot joint with vanilla iced long johns, wax lips crammed with sugar water, notebook paper, swollen sour pickles buoyant in a splintered barrel, school supplies, pixie sticks, licorice whips, and vaguely warped 45s by Fontella Bass or Johnny Taylor. And ooh, what's that blue pepper piercing the air with the nouns of backwood and cheap Delta cuts? Neck and gizzard, skin and claw. It's the chicken shack, wobbling on a foundation of board, greased riding relentless on three of its walls. The slick cuisine served up in virgin white cardboard boxes with Tabasco nibbling the seams, scorched wings under soaked slices of Wonder Bread, blind perch fried limp, spice like it's a mistake Mississippi done made. And speaking of, July moans around a perfect perfume tangle of eight Baptist gals on the corner of Kedzie and Warren, fanning themselves with their own impending funerals, fluid-filled ankles like tree trunks sprouting from narrow slingbacks, choking in Sears' best cinnamon-tinged hose, their, uh, their legs so unlike their arms and faces. On the other side of the street is everything they are trying to be beyond, everything they are trying to ignore, the great promise of government, 25 floors of lying windows, of peeling grates called balconies, of yellow panties and shredded diapers fluttering from open windows of them nasty girls with wide avenue hips stumping double dutch in this concrete courtyard, spewing their woman verses, too fueled and irreversible to be not listened to and wiggled against, and the Madison Street bus revs its tired engine, backs up a little for traction, and drives smoothly into the sweaty space between their legs, which is the only route out of the day we are riding through. All right, I'm going to do actually one more from Jimmy Savannah, which when I was putting it together, I was calling it a, a um, autobiography in verse because there's a lot in here about my parents coming up from the South. And um, you know how you ever look at your parents and say, I don't really even know how you two got together. 
uh, that was my mother and father. And um, so this was me almost kind of imagining. My mother was very ashamed of coming from the South, so there weren't these stories being passed on. Um, so this is what I imagine uh, it was like before they left. Fixing on the next star. Between 1916 and 1970, more than half a million African Americans left the South and migrated to Chicago. Mamas go quietly crazy, dizzied by the possibilities of a kitchen, patiently plucking hairs from the skin of supper. Swinging children from thick forearms, they hum stanzas riddled with Alabama hue and promises Jesus may have made. Homes swerve on foundations while, inside, the women wash stems and shreds of syrup from their palms and practice contented smiles, remembering that it's a sin to damn this ritual or foul the heat-sparkled air with any language less than prayer. And they wait for their loves. Men of marbled shoulders and exploded nails, their faces grizzled landscapes of scar and descent. These men stain every room they enter, drag with them a stench of souring iron. The dulled wives narrow their eyes, busy themselves with clanging and stir, then feed the sweating soldiers whose feast built upon okra and the peppered necks of chickens. After the steam dies, chewing is all there is. The slurp of spiced oil, the crunch of bone, suck of marrow, and then the conversation, which never changes, even over the children's squeals. That they say it's better up there, it begins. And it is always the woman who says this, and the man lowers his head to the table and feels the day collapse beneath his shirt. Incendiary art, I started this book thinking about the role of fire in my life while I was growing up, and then that made me think about the role of fire in the lives of many people of color, uh, beginning with the, the first line that, I, that haunted me from a uh, church uh, lyric from a song saying, it won't be water, but fire next time. Um, and so in this book, I talk about loss of life. And there's a long segment called um, uh, Sagas of the In Accidental Saint. And I'm going to read a section of that. I often ask my students uh, to listen for the voices they're not hearing before they write. And when I thought about people who were losing their lives, sometimes but not always at the hands of the police, I realized that the voice I was missing was the mother's voice. You hear the mother's voice twice, once when someone comes to tell her that her son or daughter is gone, and again, when the person deemed responsible for the loss of the son or daughter is deemed not responsible, and then she disappears. That's my son collapsed there, my son crumpled there, my son lying there, my son positioned there, my daughter repositioned there, my daughter as exhibit A there, my daughter dumped over there, my son hidden away there, my son blue there, my son dangling there, my son caged there, my daughter on the gurney there, on the slab there, in the drawer there, my daughter splayed there, my son locked down there, my son hanging there, my son bleeding out there, my son growing frigid there, my daughter deposited there, my son inside the chalk there, my daughter being bagged there, my son on the slab there, my son crushed there, my son rearranged there, my son crumpled in the door there, my daughter's neck shrinking in the noose there, my son's left eye over there, my son as exhibit B there, my son behind the wheel there, my son under the wheels there, my son slumped over the wheel there, my son, my daughter, blooded and not moving in the 
doorway, on the stoop, down the block in front of her kids, just inside the barbershop, face down in the street, outside the bodega, inside the bodega, in the back alley behind the bodega, on the videotape, a block from home, leaving home, hanging out at home, in the schoolyard, on the blacktop, in his bed, in her kitchen, in my arms, in my arms, in my arms. That's my son, shot to look thug. That's my daughter, shot to look more animal, shot as kill, shot as prey, shot as conquest, shot as solution, shot as lesson, shot as warning, shot as comeback, shot as payback, shot for sport, shot for history. That's my son not being alive anymore there. That's my child coming to rest one layer below the surface of the rest of my life there. August 19th, 2014, St. Louis, Missouri. Kajim Powell, 25, was accused of shoplifting donuts and energy drinks. Police said the mentally disturbed man approached with a knife in an overhand grip. They shot him dead 15 seconds after they arrived. Video shows that Powell's empty hands were at his side. I am the mother of the darkest magician. His thousand limbs thrash in and out of your practice sight line. He is always behind, beside, and in front of you. He lunges for your neck while whistling on a side street three blocks away. Firepower throbs in every finger of his bound and idle hands. No matter where he is, he is the leading man in the stuttering convenience store video. If he is not there, he will be. If he hasn't, he is about to. If a blade's not in his hand, it's in his hand. If his hands are up, they're clawing through his pockets for something. If he's screeching, don't shoot, he's clearly saying, please, I'm tired. Help me fall down. March 3rd, 2014, Iberia Parish, Louisiana. Police say that Victor White III, 22, shot himself while handcuffed in the back of a police cruiser. November 19th, 2013, Durham, North Carolina. Police say that Jesus Herrera, 17, shot himself while handcuffed in the back of a police cruiser. July 29th, 2012, Jonesboro, Arkansas. Police say that Chavis Carter, 21, shot himself while handcuffed in the back of a police cruiser. He reached back and found his own hands with his own hands, worked his bound fingers to set his free fingers loose, then used that shackled hand to free the other shackled hand, and the freed shackled hand, still shackled, was still bound to the other hand once both were free. Once free in the shackles, the shackled hands turned to the matter of the gun, which couldn't be there because they'd searched my baby twice, and a gun is a pretty big thing unless it isn't, unless it is dreamed alive by hands that believe they are no longer shackled. Stunned in cuffs, but free in searching, the left and right hands found a gun with a stink like voodoo, a gun that couldn't have been there, wasn't there, but was. The left-handed him used a cuffed hand, which could have been either left or right, since both were free, to root around for a trigger and fire a bullet right into his left-handed head, impossible but not really, since the preferred killing hand may have preferred its shackles. The policeman, who had searched my baby twice and cuffed both his free and unfree hands behind his back before his hands found his own hands and pulled. Heard no human sound at all during all that frantic magic. No fuck is my boy struggled to get his left shackled hand to do what his right shackled hand would not do. No frenzied pound of one bracing foot against the door. No grunt or whoop of glee to mark all those times he slipped out of custody and in again. Out of custody and in again. Out of custody and in again. But they did hear the bang of the gun, the gun that wasn't there 
but was. Just when it sent that bullet into his right side of his left-handed head, sounds like sacrifice, they thought. Slumped, cocked eyes, undone, my child was amazed at the sweet hoodoo he had managed. Both left and right hands were shackled and free behind him. There was an eerie, perfect circle of smoke in his hair. March 12, 2012, Pasadena, California. Kendrick McDade, 19, was chased and shot seven times by two police officers after a 911 caller falsely reported being robbed at gunpoint by two black men. McDade's final words were, why did they shoot me? As the moon tangled its beams and grew monstrous huge over his body, he wanted that answer. As usual, his mama arrived too late. He had already dispersed and become an awkward hour. Son of the mother of mistake, his timing and root were askew, but because walk, because upright, because Africa, because decision, because Tuesday, because loaded gun, because running, because too black, because too black, because identified, because uniform, because breathless, because unable, because America, because your mama, because Mississippi, because uniform, because Obama, because the chase, because unarmed, because convenient, because mistaken, because threatened, because ritual, because no one will miss you, nobody's gonna miss you, because beast, because innocent, because they could, because they could, because they could. Because they could, because they could, because they. I usually give my sons names anybody can remember. Scapegoat, target, perp walk, oversight. The name Kendrick so squashed his potential, he should have been victim, identify, bullseye. How about accident? Yes, I never had children. I just had accidents. September 14th, 2013, Bradfield Farm, Farms, North Carolina. After being involved in a traffic accident, Jonathan Farrell, 24, knocked on the door of a nearby house for help. The woman inside called the police. They arrived and shot him 10 times. My son said, I just had an accident. I need to use the phone. She said, you're black. My son said, it it'll only take a minute. I need to call the police. She heard, call the police. My son said, I, I, know, it's I know it's late, but I, I just had an accident. She said, 911. He said, oh, okay then, you'll call 911? She said, you're black. The police said, is he black? She said, he's black. When the gun arrived, it said, I just had an accident. The gun 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 said, I just had I have uh, two more poems. Thank you very much for uh, being such a patient, wonderful audience. Um, she's doing it again. I'm sorry. Okay.
This is uh, my favorite segment of the population, it's the old black men, because uh, you just can't get over on them with anything. It's like, you know, the internet, girl, we had the internet, what was it back then, what, 42? 42 Ed, didn't we have that internet thing back there? Yeah, yeah, we had that worldwide, whatchamacallit, it, you know, and you're like, and then you go, yeah, I guess they did. Uh, <laughs> they convince you. Uh, so um, one of my favorite old black men is John Lee Hooker. Okay, no, John Lee. John Lee is a blues singer, about this tall, big Stetson hat, big glasses, just evil for no reason. Just, he do interviews, and it's like, you're not answering that. You know, I mean, it's just real evil. It's just evil. So this is called, <laughs> this is called How to Be a Lecherous Little Old Black Man and Make Lots of Money. <laughs> First, you got to get the blues. This is easy if you are a person of any gender and possess a pulse, a cheating lover, a stalking ex-lover, a used Yugo, a pumping heart, an empty wallet, a half-dead dog, an empty refrigerator, one last cigarette butt, a good memory, a nosy mama, a lonely room, a quick trigger, roving eyes, an addiction to whiskey, nothing but the clothes on your back, a Jones for your neighbor's wife, a Jones for your wife's neighbor, a positive test result, an itching to leave, an itching to stay, or any itching where there shouldn't be one. <laughs> Rub your hands slow over your body. Feel the valleys and the wrongs. Let misery chomp your spine toward collapsing. Let it fold your whole self double. Then you can walk like John Lee Hooker do. Click shuffle, bent over nose to the ground, wearing a cocked brim felt fedora that wouldn't dare fall off. Then you can think like John Lee do. I'm old as Victrola. Gotta buy a bottle of Mrs. Butterworth if I want to feel a woman but I can still sing better than you. <laughs> All right. Okay, I lied. I'm gonna do one another short one and then the final one. Is that okay? Okay. So I have this, um, I'm gonna be talking to my classes about persona poems sh soon. And as Alicia uh, pointed out, uh, Blood Dazzler is a book about Hurricane Katrina, which really didn't take shape until Katrina was personified, until she became a woman. And then there was this overarching voice for the rest of the book. But um, when you're doing a book like this, there's no real light in it. There's no real moment that you can go, okay, I can, I can just relax now. And so I thought, I have to put something in here toward the end of the book. And if Katrina was a woman, then she had a family. So the, the place that you would go uh, for the family would be the other hurricanes of 2005. So this was, a, um, this was a play, a dance theater production to Harlem stage. And when we did this part, all the lights went out and uh, mirror balls came on. And you know we started this little disco music. And I said, ladies and gentlemen, the other hurricanes of 2005. And they came out like this, you know. <laughs> Uh, so here they are. Arlene learned to dance backwards in heels that were too high. Brett prayed for a shaggy mustache made of mud and hair. Cindy just couldn't keep her windy legs together. Dennis never learned to swim. Emily whispered her gust into a thousand skins. Franklin, far-sighted and anxious, bumbled villages. Gert spat her matronly name against the city's flat face. Harvey hurled a wailing child high. Irene, the baby girl, threw wild tantrums. Jose liked the whip sound of slapping, and Lee just craved the whip. Maria's thunder skirts flew high when she danced. Nate was mannered and practical. He stormed precisely. 
Ophelia nibbled weirdly on the tips of depressions. Felipe slept too late, flailing on a wronged ocean, and Rita was a vicious flirt. She woke Felipe with rumors. Stan was born business, a gobbler of steel. Tammy crooned country, getting the words all wrong. Vince died before anyone could remember his name. Wilma opened her maw wide, flashing rot. None of them talked about Katrina. She was their odd sister, the blood dazzler. And one last. My daddy is the reason that I write. He was, um, he was a storyteller. He brought with him from the South something I call the tradition of the back porch. And at the end of the day, he would sit there and tell these great stories about um, uh, people that we knew. You know, like my mother and father were, you guys remember malted milk balls? My mother and father worked in that candy factory all their working lives. So long that uh, three years after my mother retired, if you walked into the room where she was, it would smell like sugar. Her skin would smell like sugar. Um, but my father would tell these great stories. It was like, what was going on at the candy factory? And, and who was cheating on whose wife? And you know, it was like this whole serial, it was my own little soap opera. And it taught me to, to look at stories in other ways from what I was or was not learning in school. It was fantastic. And my dad taught me how to cook. I'm only a child. My mother was the functional parent. You know, she spanked me and took me to church and spanked me and took me back to church. Uh, <laughs> And my father was the rogue, you know, he was like, he would go and, and sing in these blues clubs, these bars, and the open mics, he was terrible, but he would do it. And he would take me with him, and he taught me how to drink, that's another story I'm not telling you right now. But uh, he also taught me how to cook. So my mother was watching television, and my father and I would go in the kitchen, and then, what's it going to be today? And, you know, we'd cook. So this is, um, this is about that. It's called When the Burning Begins. The recipe for hot water cornbread is simple. Cornmeal, hot water. Mixed till sluggish, then dollop in a sizzling skillet. When you smell the burning begin, flip it. When you smell the burning begin again, dump it onto a plate. You've got to wait for the burning and get it just right. Before the bread cools down, smear it with sweet salted butter and smash it with your fingers. Crumble it up in a bowl of collard greens or buttermilk. Forget that I'm telling you, it's the first thing I ever cooked. That my daddy was laughing and breathing and no bullet in his head when he taught me. Mix it till it looks like quicksand, he'd say. Till it moves like a slow song sounds. We'd sit there in the kitchen, licking our fingers, and laughing at my mother, who was probably scrubbing something with bleach, or watching Bonanza, or thinking how stupid it was to be burning that nasty old bread in that cast iron skillet. She always, uh, she always baked her cornbread until it was plump and sugary. And she'd banded me hopeless as a homemaker, too damn interested in sitting in the kitchen in the half dark, learning nothing at all from a man who had other women and stayed out late on Saturday nights. When I told her that I'd fixed my first ever pan of hot water cornbread and that my daddy had branded it glorious, she sniffed and kept mopping the floor over and over in the same space. So here's how you do it. You take out a bowl, like we, the one we had with blue flowers and only one crack. You put the cornmeal in it. Then you turn on the hot water and you let it run while you tell the secret about the boy who kissed your cheek after school or about how you really want to be a reporter instead of a teacher or a nurse like Mama says. And the water keeps running while Daddy says, you will be a wonderful writer and you will be famous someday. And when you get famous, if I wrote you a letter and sent you some money, would you write about me? And he is laughing and breathing and no bullet in his head. 
So you let the water run into this mix until it moves like mud moves at the bottom of a river, which is another thing Daddy said. And even though I'd never even seen a river, I knew exactly what he meant. Then you turn the fire way up under the skillet and you pour in this mix that moves like mud moves at the bottom of a river, like quicksand, like a slow song sounds. That stuff pops something awful when it first hits that blazing skillet. And sometimes Daddy and I would dance to those angry pop sounds. He let me rest my feet on top of his while we waltzed around the kitchen and my mother huffed and puffed on the other side of the door. When you are famous, Daddy asked me, will you write about dancing in the kitchen with your father? I say everything I write will be about you. Then you will be famous too. And we dip and swirl and spin, but then he stops and sniffs the air. The thing you have to remember about hot water cornbread is to wait for the burning so you know when to flip it. And then again so you know when it's crusty and done. Then eat it the way we did, with our fingers our feet still tingling from dancing. But remember that sometimes that burning takes such a long time. And in that time, sometimes, poems are born. Thank you all very much. <laughs>